Invasive species are animals that we as human beings have moved around the planet to places that they're not supposed to be. When introduced into these new ecosystems, they can outcompete or end up killing tons of native animals. In this list, we're going to break down the five most invasive species in the world. Many of you may already heard of the massive problem of the cane toad. Now the cane toad is a true toad. It's a large bufo species that was introduced in the early 30s to combat cane beetle. Australia is one of the highest producers of sugarcane in the world, and with sugarcane comes cane beetle, a terrible pest. Well, before pesticides were widespread, people had to figure out how to deal with pests. And so somebody had the genius idea that they're going to introduce cane toads to eat the cane beetles. Well, they brought cane toads over in the early 30s and cane toad numbers exploded. Sure enough, they did very little to combat cane beetle because cane toads can't climb. They weren't able to reach most of the cane beetle. So now Australia has a massive cane toad problem and a massive cane beetle problem. Well, things got much worse because cane toads happen to have a highly toxic venom sac right behind their eyeballs and anything that eats them in Australia has not co-evolved with cane toads for millions of years with the ability to either eat around the toxin or be resilient to the toxin. And so you have things like 90% population reductions in animals like quolls, goannas, snakes, certain things like that that have no resilience to this toxin. Today, there are over 200 million cane toads across Australia, and the number is growing. They're moving at a rate of about 25 miles per year to the point at which they're going to saturate the entire continent. Now, you might ask yourself, what can be done? We have a 90% reduction in certain predators and species, they're out competing other species, and they're going to cover the entire continent. Well, there's a little bit of good news when it comes to the cane toad. Colossal Biosciences is using CRISPR technology and stem cells to engineer resilience in animals like northern quolls so that hopefully one day those animals can go in and consume the cane toads and be resilient to their toxin. And so slowly over time, they may be able to wipe out these booming giant toads that have taken over a continent where they're never supposed to be. This really goes to show us Humans interfering by bringing in species is one of the biggest problems we've ever had. And when we do it intentionally, it's so much worse than when we do it by accident. And now because of our bad intentions, because of our bad ideas with maybe good intentions, we have seen a massive reduction in such incredible native fauna. So the big question is, can we get rid of cane toads? Can we ever get rid of this massive problem that is wiping out native species? Well, if colossal is successful and can engineer a resilience in species that's passed on generationally, yes, that might help. But with over 200 million and growing cane toads, I would rate the likelihood of us ever being able to eradicate the species a very slim 2 out of 10. Next up, a slithering menace that is wiping out species right here in the United States. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard about the Burmese python and the growing problems that they cause in the US. Burmese python are a giant snake that have been recorded up to lengths of 23 feet that are taking over the Florida Everglades. Now, when I say they're taking over, they're eating everything, right? They're eating all of the raccoons, the opossums, they're even eating alligators and things like that, and they're out-competing native species in Florida. Because Florida is such a rich environment with so many animals, species like caiman, nightfish, iguanas are just prolific there, and these are all invasive species, and the Burmese python is the biggest threat among all of them. Now, why would this giant snake that's native to Southeast Asia be taking over the Everglades, you might ask? Well, the invasion started in the 1990s and early 2000s when these pythons became popular in the pet trade because they get large, they're beautiful, and they eat anything. More than 90,000 were imported into the US, but during Hurricane Andrew in 1992, a python breeding facility was destroyed, releasing a couple dozen snakes into the wild, and from those few dozen, thousands have exploded. By 2007, Burmese pythons were found as far north as the Florida Panhandle and all the way down to the tip of Florida. And as soon as these Burmese pythons began to take over the entire state of Florida, we started to see a massive decline in native species. Now, when you go to the Everglades, you think, wow, this place is so full of life. But think about this. Sightings of raccoons are down by 99%. Opossums down by 98%. White-tailed deer, big giant deer, down by 94%. Bobcat populations, which are a predator, have dropped by 87%, and rabbits are nearly non-existent. They're gone from the area, and this is all due to the Burmese python. 
native predators like American alligators are in conflict with these pythons. While they may not be eating each other directly, they are a little bit, but they may not be doing that for most of the time. When you wipe out something like 99% of the raccoon population, that leaves very little for alligators to prey upon. So it creates this massive imbalance. Now, you might be asking yourself, how are we going to combat that? Well, there are guys on Instagram that go out there and target these things that have made it kind of sporting. There's the Florida Python Challenge, where in 2023 alone, 209 pythons were removed in a competition. So there are active attempts to remove these animals from Florida. But the problem is these Burmese pythons are so adaptable that they've even changed their physiology to be able to feed year round in Florida. They've become more cold tolerant and they've even brought parasites and diseases with them from Southeast Asia, which are starting to affect the native reptiles in Florida. So there are these efforts to control the population, but they are just booming and they're an elusive snake. They burrow themselves under the grass, under grass mats, they hide, they can reproduce massively with you know dozens and dozens of eggs, sometimes up to 80 plus eggs can be in a single clutch of snakes that can weigh up to 200 plus pounds. You know? So the point is they can reproduce so quickly and they eat so much that it's almost impossible to see us being able to catch up to their rate of reproduction, especially when they really don't have many real predators once they reach a certain size. So I would say that the Burmese python problem really is out of control in Florida. And even with all the efforts out there, I would give the likelihood of us ever being able to truly eradicate Burmese pythons a very, very low one out of 10. Next up, a starfish so invasive that the Australian government officially launched the Starfish Wars to try and get rid of it. The crown of thorn starfish is a hardcore predator of hard coral polyps. It's this giant spiny tropical starfish that will wreak havoc on a coral ecosystem. Native from the Red Sea through the western coast of central Australia, wherever they are, they eat coral like crazy. The problem with the crown of thorn starfish isn't the fact that they eat coral, that's normal. The problem is that they can boom and bust, and when they boom, they go into things called plagues, which is a real scene. Back in the day, from the 1960s to the 1980s, these starfish were popping up all over the Indo-Pacific, mostly at Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Densities hitting up to a thousand starfish per hectare were just wiping out coral polyps faster than the coral could regrow, and when you combine that with the bleaching taking place on Australia's Great Barrier Reef, it was just a disaster and a collapse for coral reef communities that are home to all of the fish species and all of the animals that we all so knowingly love from that part of the world. And as these starfish boomed and coral reef communities started to get eaten so quickly, it meant that there could be a shift in coral reef communities, which is the foundation for that entire marine ecosystem. So things got so bad that the Queensland government stepped in funding research and setting up committees to deal with the starfish in an effort that became known as the Starfish Wars because the crown of thorn starfish was just such a coral munching machine. This made it an ecosystem disruptor, which just threw the whole system into chaos and leaving behind bare skeletons of reef with no algal bloom, no vibrant colors, no staghorn corals, nothing that could regrow fast enough as these starfish were eating the polyps. So people had to actually do everything they could to try and get rid of these starfish, but at the end of the day, the only thing they could really do was physically remove them by diving on reefs, grabbing them and pulling them out. The problem is they reproduce so quickly and coral reefs are in such jeopardy from temperature shift that the starfish are sort of the straw that could potentially break the camel's back if they're not dealt with. However, because these things boom and bust, and because crown of thorn starfish are very physically tangible, you can dive in an area and see them and collect them, I actually think that our ability to manage and control them is much higher than many of the other species. So our ability to hold these back to a sustainable level, to me, is a pretty healthy eight out of 10. Next up, your at-home kitty could be leading to extinctions. Now, I'm sure you all know what a feral cat is, so no need to go into great introductions there, but let's get straight into it. Feral cats are a problem nearly everywhere in the world. They threaten the most species overall, which is 430 different species that have been identified as being at risk of extinction for feral cats, and 63 species that have actually become extinct due to feral cats. 
Cats are a major problem. If you get a cat or if you have a cat, don't let it go and reproduce outside. Please get it fixed. As a case study, let's look at Australia. I know, Australia is getting picked on a lot today. But introduced by European colonists as pets in the early 1800s, native Australian animals did not evolve alongside them. Australia is home to approximately 3.8 million domestic cats and up to 6.3 million feral cats. Now, native animals have been driven towards extinction. Their impact on ground nesting birds, such as malafowl or small mammals, such as the endangered bilby, have been massive and led those animals right towards extinction. Feral cats are a major player in altering Australian ecosystems. Their predatory habits have caused devastating declines in native species population. Research has actually shown that feral cats in Australia kill an average of 740 wild animals per year. And if you take the number of feral cats that there are in Australia and multiply that, that is a ridiculous amount of decline of native species. And the compounding effects have actually led to 22 endemic Australian mammals being driven to extinction since European settlement due to cat introductions. Small marsupials, reptiles, Birds that evolved without natural defenses against these predators have all suffered massively. Efforts to manage feral cat populations in Australia face massive challenges. They're reported to be present across 99.8% of the Australian continent. So the problem is the cats in Australia are so widespread and they're so good at reproducing and taking over habitats that they've now become impressively large. Some of these cats are absolutely massive, as you'll see in some of these photos, and that's making them look like small cougars, and they're able to eat larger and larger prey. So the cats are kind of out of control, but Australia is doing measures to eradicate them. Hunting for feral cats is legal, and people are working towards it. The problem is cats are smart, right? We have leopards that live in downtown cities in India and these big cats like mountain lions that walk through downtown Los Angeles and you don't even know they're there. Now these feral domestic cats are descendants of those incredible cats and they're just as capable as many of those animals. So eradicating them when they've covered so much of Australia, even where humans aren't, is going to be incredibly challenging and eradicating them globally, if you ask me, is near impossible. So I give this one a zero out of 10 of us ever being able to actually control them through direct eradication. Next up, a venomous fish that is so beautiful that people wanted to keep them in their aquariums. Lionfish are striking marine fish native to the Indo-Pacific, and when you're diving in the Indian Ocean and you see them, they are a rare treat. Because of this, people wanted to keep them in their fish tanks. So they went out and collected these stunning fish, put them in their tanks, but as usual, people screwed it up. So what happened was lionfish were in the pet trade, specifically in Florida. They were being reproduced, they were being sold. They're gorgeous in aquariums, but somebody or a couple somebody's ended up releasing them into the waterways. Well, Florida, being the incredible ecosystem that it is, was fully supportive of these amazing fish being there, as far as an ecosystem goes, and they were able to reproduce like wildfire. These fish spread out of control and now colonize areas all the way north of Florida, down into the Caribbean, and way out to sea, and have become a major problem because, like many of the other invasive species that we've talked about in this video, they don't have predators that know how to deal with them. They have all these amazing venomous spines that if you put your hand on them or if you're a bigger fish and you try and eat them and you get stabbed with those spines, that venom makes them impalpable and can end up actually killing the animals that are trying to eat them. In addition to that, these things are voracious predators able to eat basically anything they can fit in their mouths. So they have taken over the Western Atlantic by eating all of these tiny little fish. We actually did a video on diving for and catching and cooking these beautiful lionfish. Check it out in the link right here. It's a lot of fun, but it shows you just how cool these animals are and how delicious they are, but mostly it shows you how abundant they are. Fish populations on reefs where these lionfish have been found have been decimated by up to 80% in certain areas, which is a massive decline. And as that declines in diversity, that can lead to ecosystem collapse, which is a huge, huge problem. Efforts to control lionfish populations have actually been pretty good. There have been these big projects like at the Green Turtle Key where they have the lionfish derby where people come in and try and catch them and shoot them. Because lionfish are not a pelagic fish and they're not super fast moving, they tend to hang out in little spotty areas. And if you're able to wipe them out from one little reef patch, then until they recolonize with their pelagic larvae, that area tends to recover. 
the problem is lionfish can go much deeper than human beings can dive. Their babies are really, really tiny. They're hard to find when they're reproducing. So really what we have to do is just target them and get rid of them through removal of spearfishing them as much as possible. And I will say this, it's actually really great to promote the commercial harvesting and consumption of these fish because when you do that, people get excited by the competition aspect and going out and killing and cooking and eating these lionfish, and that has helped bounce back. It took a long time for people to be able to really understand that lionfish are good table fare and that they're worth targeting and how harmful they are, but now that's starting to catch on. And although they're very widespread, I feel like eradication is kind of futile, but control is possible. So with people continuing to push and continuing to try and get rid of lionfish, I think our likelihood of at least controlling them is pretty good with a solid six out of 10. Invasive species are a major problem the world over. This is just a quick look into a couple of them. There are so many more. Let me know if you want me to dig into this topic further. Thanks, make sure you like and subscribe.